You can't hear anything? Well, then you'll have to be quieter. <laughs> because uh, I don't know if we can turn this up any louder, but uh, someone from the multiplex is here. Maybe we can make that. And until then, we'll have to start it. So anyways, uh, I'm. let me start with saying um, I'm so proud of our incredible community. Thank you all for showing up today. I'm always amazed by our community. Never surprised, but I'm always amazed, so thank you. Um, my name is Robert Belay, and I am the mayor for the town of Athabasca. I can't go any louder. Sorry, guys. You have to come closer, um, or else until we get this, this turned up. So, um, yeah, I would like to uh, welcome everyone on behalf of, of, of town council and uh, Athabasca County Council and the Village of Boyle Council. Uh, I would like to welcome you and thank you for all being here. It's awesome to see so many familiar faces in the crowd, uh, our business leaders. Um, we have many leaders from uh, our service groups are here and, and that's awesome. And we see many uh, community uh, leaders here as well. Uh, I noticed that Aspen View School Division, the, I think the entire board is here. So thank you for that. And Neil O'Shea, uh, the superintendent as well. Uh, I see many faces from Athabasca University. Thank you for coming today. Uh, and last but not least, there's all these young people that are here. Thank you to Aspen School for allowing me to be here. You're never gonna get, and you know, you're never gonna learn anything like this in your classroom. So this is a life experience that's gonna be awesome for you from going forward. And we look forward to some of your questions at the end of all this. So um, it is, uh, now we'll go with the, uh, we'll move on to, uh, it is my extreme pleasure and, and privilege. Um, that's as loud as I can be. Is that better? Oh, sorry, Premier, you're gonna have to scream into the mic. I'm, I apologize for that. All right. Um, it is my privilege uh, to uh, welcome uh, the Premier and Leader of, of, of our province, the Honorable Jason Kenney. Uh, it also here is um, Minister of Advanced Education, Demetrius Nicolaitis. That's quite a, a handful, Demetrius. And, and also uh, the Minister of Agriculture, Forestry, and Rural Economic Development. Is that correct? Nate Horner, so uh, the Honorable Nate Horner. So as well, we have our MLA uh, here as well uh, from uh, uh, Athabasca Barhead Westlaw, Glenn Van Dyken. He doesn't need an introduction really, so. So I think you've heard enough from me. You didn't come here to, to uh, listen to me, although uh, that would be okay too. Uh, so I would now like to call upon uh, the, um, MLA uh, Van Dyken, Glenn Van Dyken, to come up and say a few words. Good, thank you, Rob, and uh, especially thank you everyone that's here. Uh, it's an important day for Athabasca. It's an important day for uh, Athabasca University, and uh, there's been a lot of work that's been put in advocacy from the community to get us to this day. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, we're able to gather here today to, uh, to essentially announce the, the, the ability for Athabasca University to see, succeed well into the future in the town of Athabasca. Um, it, it's been two and a half years of uh, uh, advocacy work and uh, letter writing and, and meetings to get us to this point. And so congratulations on, on the community for being involved in that process. So I'd like to welcome all of you coming here today. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Belay and, and uh, Reeve uh, Hall. Welcome to uh, Premier Jason Kenney, uh, Advanced Education Me uh, Minister Nick, uh, Demetrius Nicolaides and uh, Agriculture, Forestry, Rural Development, Nate Horner. And uh, it's good to have you here in my constituency. It's an important day for my constituency and for all the people here in Athabasca. 
In, before I introduce Minister Nicolaides, I wanted to say a few words about why we are gathered here today. For nearly 40 years, Athabasca University has played an important role in Athabasca. Their move to Athabasca has led to incredible growth and success for the university and the Athabasca region. We want to see them continue to succeed and to support the local community, providing important job opportunities uh, to the residents in this area. As a key economic driver for the town, Athabasca University, Canada's online university, we see several ways that AU can balance both advancing their specialization in distance learning and providing opportunities for the, the region here and for the people in Athabasca. That's why I'm happy to join all of you here today to introduce the Minister of Advanced Education, Demetrius Nicolaides. Minister Nicolaides has done a phenomenal job transforming post-secondary education across the province, ensuring all Albertans have access to post-secondary education to further their careers and join the workforce of tomorrow while maintaining a strong focus upon Alberta and the opportunities that post-secondary institutions can provide to their local communities. I want to thank Minister Nicolaides for taking the time to listen. Um, probably one of the busiest files that I've dealt with, but Minister Nicolaides was always there to listen as well as the Premier. Over the last two and a half years, uh, Minister Nicolaides has made himself available many times to not only listen to concerns from myself, but also town and county elected representatives, local service clubs, alumni, and of course the Keep Athabasca in Athabasca University Advocacy Group. So again, I thank you, Minister, and I thank you, Premier, for being here today to report not only what we have heard, but what our government is doing to ensure the long-term success of Athabasca University, as well as the economic prosperity and growth of the town of town and county of Athabasca. So with that, I hand the mic over to uh, Advanced Education Minister Demetrius Nicolaides. Okay, that doesn't quite work, but uh, thank you very much, uh, Glenn, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a real honor and privilege for me to be here uh, with all of you today. I want to first thank and acknowledge um, uh, His Worship Mayor Belay for uh, many conversations that we've had, both in person, on the phone, text message, virtual. I think we've covered every mode of communication, Mayor. Uh, so thank you for your incredible engagement. And as well to Reeve Hall, uh, similarly, thank you for all of your work and advocacy. And I've, I've really enjoyed uh, working closely with, with both of you to get a, a strong understanding of, of how we can move forward together. And in that note, I also want to take just a quick moment to thank and acknowledge uh, your MLA here, MLA Van Dyken. Uh, I have to say, he is a, a fierce advocate for the community. Uh, he's been in my office several times and uh, catching me uh, uh, between meetings and uh, always uh, relaying the important concerns uh, that he's hearing from the community. So I just want to thank and, and acknowledge his in incredible advocacy for the region. And of course, uh, thanks to, to my colleague, um, uh, Minister Horner, and, and, and Premier Kenny as well, who I know will be uh, talking uh, in more details uh, shortly after I'm done here. Uh, but of course, it's always a dangerous thing to give a politician a microphone, so I'll try to be <laughs> brief and, and hand things over to, to Premier Kenny here. But I, I do want to say, you know, it's, it's been a real honor and privilege for me as in the past three years as Minister of Advanced Education to uh, work more closely with the town here and, and work more closely with Athabasca University. And uh, for me, I always like to look at, uh, at a little bit of the history. I like to get an understanding when I'm learning new things about why things are the way they are. And with Athabasca University, of course, I think as everybody here knows probably better than I, that one of the, the, the real vision behind Athabasca University was to be a destiny, uh, 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 an institution that provides opportunities to Albertans who aren't able to access uh, an institution on a physical campus. Their mandate 
was to provide educational programming to all citizens uh, and residents of Alberta through a distance delivery model. And they've excelled and they've exceeded in that model and are taking bold new steps forward, which I think is incredibly exciting. The university is moving forward in becoming Canada's online university, which I think is a vision we should all embrace. And I think is a vision that is incredibly inspirational. Just today, in fact, I learned, and, and I apologize, I don't have all the details, and, and Premier, this may be news to you as well, but I just learned that McDonald's has entered into a new partnership with Athabasca University to make university programming available to their employees to help upgrade their academic skills and credentials. And I think that that speaks to the opportunity that exists with Athabasca University. Indeed, I do strongly believe that Athabasca University can grow as Canada's online university, deliver programming to all Albertans, to Canadians, and to the world in a model, in an online model that has uh, uh, become much more normal these days. And so I do strongly support uh, that vision in that direction. But at the same time, I do firmly believe that Athabasca University can excel in that vision of becoming Canada's online university while building and maintaining jobs right here in the community. And uh, I won't go into more details. Uh, I'll be happy to pass things to uh, Premier Kenny to provide more details about some of those steps. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Demetrius. So, uh, Nate Horner here has the longest title in government, Minister of Agriculture, Forestry, and Rural Economic Development. All very important jobs. And Demetrius Nicolaides has the longest name. Um, <laughs> And, and congratulations, Glenn and Mayor, for getting it right. Uh, Demetrius has a PhD in political science, but I told him when I asked him to become Minister of Advanced Education, the main reason is that he worked in the back of his parents' Greek restaurant, working hard as a young kid when he was 10 years old, and that's the Alberta work ethic that we look for in public service. Thank you very much, Demetrius, for all that you do. Thank you, MLA Van Dyken, for being a relentless voice for your community here in Athabasca and all across this part of Alberta, uh, Mayor, Reeve, Councillors, and uh, community. Looks like we have almost a quarter of the population of Athabasca in this room, it's so fantastic. And really nice to welcome, uh, I guess, a lot of the kids from the high school here to talk about an institution that's so important to this community. In 1984, Peter Lougheed uh, and his government chose Athabasca to be the host of Canada's uh, Distance Learning University, Athabasca University. And Peter Lougheed said, when he made that announcement here uh, nearly 40 years ago, he said that this was going to be Canada's, uh, part of Alberta's gift to Canada. <clears throat> and he said that because, you know, our province has often had really good economic times, and other Canadians have benefited from that. And we always have to look at how we can share some of our good fortune with the rest of Canada. And his idea was a a world-class distance learning institution that all Canadians who couldn't access a bricks and mortar a post-secondary institution could benefit from Alberta's investment in this facility. But he also made it clear that Athabasca University was a strategy to support the rural economy. And in the 1970s and 80s, uh, his government made uh, huge important investments in developing the infrastructure and improving services in uh, rural Alberta, including in this region. And uh, the idea was basically this, that not all of our public institutions have to be located in Edmonton, in the capital, or in our two big cities. That we can do big and important things in rural Alberta. And I agree with this vision. I grew up in a small prairie town, not in Alberta, but like many Albertans, I grew up in Saskatchewan. I'm a, Sus I'm a Sasky, I'm a Riders fan. Um, and I uh, grew up in a little village. Any other Riders fans here, by the way? There you go, go Riders. Um, 
I grew up in a little village of about 300 people, actually home to a small college, Notre Dame. My dad was president of that. It's famous for hockey. I wasn't one of the star hockey players. I was one of the kind of the geeky kids on the debate club, Nate, but, uh, but I, you know, Notre Dame, you know, that town in Wilcox, Saskatchewan used to have a thousand people before the depression and now minus the school, it's down to maybe 250. So I, I've lived and seen firsthand the struggle that many rural communities in the prairies go through to maintain their population, their services and their future. And uh, that is why the vision of Peter Lougheed is so important to Alberta. We also need to recognize that the majority of the wealth developed in Alberta comes from our rural regions. The, the enormous natural resource wealth of this province. And without the, the resource industries, agriculture, forestry, oil and gas, and so much more, we wouldn't really have much of an Alberta economy. And so people in the big cities need to recognize that the, the, the hospitals they go to, the schools they benefit from, the economy and prosperity of this province wouldn't happen without the hard work of rural Albertans. And that they, we therefore have an obligation to ensure uh, a, a long-term future prosperity and good quality public services uh, to rural communities. And that was, again, part of the reason. I mean, they could have set up AU in Edmonton or in Calgary, but they made a very deliberate choice to locate it here uh, in Athabasca. And over that time, AU has grown and, and become uh, developed a, a uh, global reputation and has a compelling vision to be Canada's online university and ser provide services to people all around the world. And uh, that is a great, it's an institutional ambassador for this province. And I want to thank the board of directors, the staff, faculty and students and everybody involved for all of that. Uh, however, in recent years, uh, there has been, as you know, a debate and some tension about how rooted the institution should be in Athabasca. And some have said, well, now that we're in the internet world, there really is no bricks and bricks and mortar institutions and everything's virtual. And if this is going to be an online university, then, uh, then we should uh, abandon the, the idea that it is located in any one particular place. It exists on the, uh, on the internet. It's a virtual university. But at the end of the day, as I've been saying to my colleagues, um, no, this is a university, a post-secondary institution is a community and it needs a heart it needs to be able to have a culture and you can't replicate that virtually online yes you can have provide lots of of services to reach the world to reach learners across the world through the internet but you still need to be grounded somewhere and the vision of this institution is always to be grounded and rooted in the community of Athabasca. I want to thank MLA Van Dyken, the mayor and council, the Reeve and council. Sorry, this is bad. Sorry, I'm having real, I think it's, um, should I come over here? Well, I've got the TV. Is that any better? I think that's better, maybe a little bit, yeah. So, folks, the point is this, that there's been some tension as some of the uh, positions associated with the university have migrated elsewhere, leases have been signed in other cities, and the local community, many of you have spoken to us uh, as the government of Alberta to, to express, I think, real legitimate concern about the future. And so we are here today to address that and to resolve that. And let me just say this. Uh, we believe that Athabasca University uh, must be rooted in this community for its long-term future. And so, uh, Minister Nicolaides has uh, sent a directive to the uh, volunteer board of this institution, first of all indicating that we will be amending the regulations uh, under the uh, Athabasca University Act to ensure a permanent representation on the AU board for members of the local Athabasca community. cabinet just recently appointed one such individual with two more to come at our next cabinet meeting. Next, we have uh, expressed our, our reaffirmed our, the, the commitment 
to supporting the local community and fulfilling the recommendations of the Coates Report, which suggested the university work towards expanding the size of its operation in the town of Athabasca and in northern Alberta generally. More specifically, we have directed the Board of Governors to strengthen its physical presence in the town of Athabasca by consolidating executive and senior administration offices in Athabasca at the earliest possible opportunity. We've also directed uh, the board to develop and implement a comprehensive talent development attraction and retention strategy by June 30th of this year to maintain and grow a broad range of employees in Athabasca and to develop and implement a reopening strategy for the Athabasca campus to resume most employees working on site and to allow public access to services like registries to student support and specialized services. So we believe that these steps will demonstrate AU's commitment to supporting the local community and Alberta's government is prepared uh, to support the institution in this mission. We will invest and I've, we directed Invest Alberta, our new investment promotion agency, uh, to meet with the town and council, uh, the, the mayor and council uh, in the county to develop a long-term economic plan to attract and retain talent in this community while co creating new employment opportunities for residents. So this is very good news for the future of this institution and its home here in Athabasca. And I just want to close by saying thank you to all of you in this community and to AU for your diligence as we got through the last two tough years of COVID. It's been tough on all of us, but it's been tough on the whole world, let's face it. And uh, we Albertans pulled together. We proved that we are resilient and Alberta strong. How about a special hand for all of our frontline healthcare workers and all that they've done for the last two years? So it's been a couple of really challenging years and sadly there's been division in our society. But I just want to say this as a word of encouragement. Uh, because I think we have good reason to believe that the worst of, of COVID is uh, in the past. And now we see a new era of opportunity and I think prosperity dawning on this province. We've been through a few tough years economically and, and this region lost some people, lost some population with the downturn in the energy sector and other challenges. You've had some bad weather and agriculture here. And yet, and yet, last year, Athabasca led, was well ahead of Alberta in, ter in terms of the number of new businesses started. So the entrepreneurial drive in this province and this region is alive and well. And now we are leading Canada in economic growth, leading Canada in job growth. That's why we were able to top table and today we'll be passing the first balanced budget tabled in 14 years that also invested in additional public services and healthcare and education because the province's finances are coming back under uh, in order in part because of economic diversification. It's not just strong commodity prices. Last year was the best year ever in our forestry industry, in high tech, digital and venture capital, in film and television, um, in in uh, we're seeing the development of uh, actually last year was the best year ever for exports, the second best year ever on record for manufacturing. Um, we have huge new industries coming to this province, $18 billion of petrochemical projects that have been announced. Many of those will be built northeast of Edmonton and will benefit uh, people in this part of the province. Uh, we've had, we, Alberta is becoming a global hub for the new hydrogen industry. Both that and the petrochemicals will ensure a long-term future for upstream natural gas, exploration and production, midstream pipeline jobs, great blue-collar service jobs, and a long-term future for our energy sector. And speaking of the energy sector, those who tried to count out Alberta's responsible energy now realize in the wake of Putin's invasion of Ukraine that the world does need more responsibly produced democratic energy to displace conflict oil around the world. Tell you, I work. We are work. I am working with allies in the U.S. Congress on uh, a, str a strategy to get more of our responsibly pr produced energy to the U.S. and global markets. Here's the. Here's my point. 
Uh, I think we are, are very likely at the beginning of a sustained period of prosperity. And the single biggest challenge we will have is not enough people and uh, with the right skills for the jobs of the future. And that's where AU, that's where your high school, that's where our, our education and post-secondary education systems come in. We need we, and have, are developing a people strategy. That's why, for example, uh, we have a revised Alberta's immigration strategy, the Alberta Advantage Immigration Strategy. We've, we've launched two specific streams to benefit rural communities that have been struggling to retain and grow their population. We have enough people in our two big cities. We need more hard-working newcomers and immigrant entrepreneurs to help build the economic future of Athabasca and rural Alberta. And we're committed to making sure, and I know that your community wants to welcome more of those newcomers. Some of them may be Ukrainian refugees. And I want to thank Athabasca in the region for being a welcoming place. Please help us welcome more newcomers to ensure our future prosperity. And we're making key investments. This year, a $600 million investment in our budget for the Alberta Works Strategy, which will provide targeted funding uh, to post-secondary institutions, to provide for uh, in-demand training programs. We're, working, we're trying to encourage or to return to more vocational education and, and, and apprenticeship learning, including for high school kids, more than doubling the size of the RAP program and careers the next generation and so much more. So there's a lot of exciting work going on. We believe AU uh, can be a key part of it. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks for your commitment to this province and God bless. Uh, th thank you, Premier. Thank you, uh, Minister Nicolaitis and Mr. Uh, Horner and MLA uh, Van Dyken um, for sharing your, your government's vision for, in particular, our region and also rural Alberta in, in general. And let's give them one big hand once again. So we have time for about, about, about 25 to 30 minutes of question and answer period. So uh, I think we'll kick things off. Uh, I'll be the moderator. Unfortunately, we only have one mic, so I want to be chasing around the room here, I guess. Uh, and then chasing back to get the answers from one of the, the premier or, or one of the ministers. So we'll start, start things off with our students. And I think we have uh, a young lady here who's got a question for the premier. So if you would like to stand up. Bonjour, Monsieur Kenny. Je m'appelle Samaya Burry, et j'ai 11 ans. Je suis étudiante de sixième année dans la classe de Madame Jones à l'école de Landing Trail à Athabasca. Dans ma classe, nous étudions le concept de démocratie qui inclut de la recherche sur les partis politiques à notre élection de classe. J'étais élu premier ministre de ma classe pour le UCP. Ma question pour vous, Monsieur Kenny, est. Que pensez-vous peuvent faire les jeunes de mon âge de notre communauté pour améliorer notre communauté? Merci. Hello, Premier Kenny. My name is Samaya Burry, and I'm 11 years old. I am in grade 6 in Madame Jones's homeroom class at Landing Trail Intermediate School in Athabasca. Grade 6 students at our school study democracy and participate in many democratic exercises, including Student Vote Alberta and Student Vote Canada. We also do research on political parties and have a class election where I was elected Premier for the UCP. My question for you, Premier Kenny, is what do you think young people my age can do in our community to help our community thrive? Thank you. Alors, merci beaucoup, Samaya, de votre question. Est-ce que, est que le vôtre une école francophone? C'est une école d'immersion française, non? C'est une école d'immersion, voilà. Uh, so, Samaya translated the question. Alors, je vais répondre en, en français, and then I'll do a quick English. 
translation. Tout d'abord, félicitations dans votre élection en tant que premier ministre. Et peut-être, à l'avenir, vous pouvez être premier ministre de l'Alberta. Pourquoi pas? Il faut ajouter évidemment qu'une des gradués, une des diplômées auparavant de l'université de l'Athabasca, mon prédécesseur Ralph Klein était une diplômée de l'université. Et euh, alors, merci de votre question et merci de votre intérêt dans les affaires publiques. Et vous, vous avez euh, posé la question, comment est-ce que vous pouvez être mieux impliqué hein, dans le futur? Et, et je, je suggérais euh, le bénévolat. Je crois que c'est la meilleure façon de donner euh, de vous-même à votre communauté. Il y a tellement de, de, des opportunités de faire le bénévolat. Évidemment, on a vu tellement de ça pendant la pandémie de COVID-19. Euh, et Avec les jeunes Albertains qui ont aidé les, les aînés qui étaient chez eux, qui, qui avaient besoin de, 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 de toutes sortes d'appui. Alors, euh, mais il faut dire que c'est possible d'être impliqué dans même les partis politiques à l'âge de 14 ans. Alors, euh, Trouvez peut-être une partie politique qui, qui vous intéresse, vous pouvez être impliqué. So I'll try to translate that quickly to say, I reminded that um, uh, actually a former, one of my predecessors, Ralph Klein, was an AU graduate. And um, so worth noting that. And I suggested that the, I think the best way to get involved in making your community better is through volunteership. And Alberta has a great tradition of that. We have more volunteer hours per capita than any Canadian province, with the exception of Newfoundland. God bless the Newfoundlanders. <laughs> and, oh, there's a few of them here, eh? And uh, we also have more higher charitable contributions than any province in the country. And we saw a great spirit of, of volunteership during the pandemic, and from a lot of young people, in, including um, your age, who did things like delivering uh, food to seniors who were shut in at home, And I know one 14-year-old in Okotoks who, whose parents gave him a 3D printer and he started making, um, he started making uh, visors for healthcare workers on his 3D printer at home. There were so many wonderful, innovative uh, efforts at volunteership. We have something called the Northern Lights Award that recognizes volunteers. And we encourage you uh, to, uh, to, to, to nominate people in the local community. I should also mention, that in honor of Her Majesty the Queen's Platinum Jubilee this year, 70 years of service, we are producing 7,000 uh, Platinum Jubilee medals to recognize volunteers in our community. And I encourage the folks here to put people forward, including some of these wonderful young people who represent the spirit of volunteership in Alberta. Okay, I was just informed that Minister Nicolaitis has to leave in about 10 minutes. So, uh, is the second student question for Minister Nicolaitis by any chance? But you don't have another one? Okay, so then I would encourage that. Oh, okay, we, do you have a question for Minister Nicolaitis? Okay. Okay, I have a question. Um, yes, I also thank all the healthcare workers especially on the front lines in the first unpredictable years, but year rather. But um, the ones that have been sent home in the last three months because they didn't get the vaccine, wondering how they're going to be compensated as they sit home without pay and now they're being called back to work. Thank you. Oops. Thank you. Fighting with the sound system here. Sorry. It's all right. So uh, thank you for the question. And we, again, once again, appreciate all of our frontline healthcare workers, uh, especially over the past two plus years. So uh, I think you're referring to uh, the Alberta Health Services having put in place in January, I believe, or the December, a, a proof of vaccination program uh, just to put that in, in context, um, Alberta's health system, like health systems all around the world, have always had uh, vaccination requirements as a requirement to work. So in Alberta, to become an employee of AHS, you have to demonstrate that you've received, for example, the uh, MMR 
vaccine, uh, the polio vaccine, and other vaccines. It's a standard condition of employment that the people in the health system are used to. That long predates the existence of AHS. It goes way back to when we had independent hospital authorities. And the uh, certainly in the COVID period, when we saw uh, in the fall with the Delta wave uh, that 90% of our intensive care patients were unvaccinated, and there was a much higher uh, transmissibility amongst unvaccinated people than vaccinated people. Uh, AHS believed that it, uh, because of their duty to care for patients, it was important to ensure that extra layer of protection that uh, people were either vaccinated or tested negatively. So they brought in a, a proof of vaccination program for COVID-19 vaccines with an option uh, for a periodic negative rapid test. And where we're at now, as I understand it, is that 99.8% of Alberta's 10,000 physicians um, are fully vaccinated, 98.7% of Alberta nurses. Um, now, in the wake of Omicron, which is much more transmissible, um, and so vaccinated people are quite able to transmit, uh, AHS has revised the policy. They've actually pulled back on that policy. And so there's no longer a uh, proof of vaccination or negative test requirement. So um, nobody who was unvaccinated was uh, required to leave work. They were given an option of a negative test. And it seems to me that was a reasonable accommodation. Uh, and of course, the responsibility of those who administer our healthcare system is the patients, patients first and foremost, and patient safety. Um, I think that, uh, but now, as I say, with the changing nature of the disease with Omicron, they've, they've pulled back on that policy, uh, although it, it, there continues to be a general vaccine requirement for new employees, as there's always been in the healthcare system. Thank you, Premier. Um, once again, I'll just reiterate that. Is there any questions for... Uh, um, okay, uh, so um, uh, we'll, uh, we'll hand the mic over to Minister Nicolaitis to say a few words. Oh, he can stay a little bit longer. Okay, so is there a question to, to him? Okay, I think we have one here, so. Oh, okay, and we'll have one there first. Hi there, my name's David Powell. I'm president of the Athabasca University Faculty Association. I've met some of you before, meeting some of you for the first time. Uh, the Athabasca jobs issue was originally started by Alpha uh, around seven years ago when uh, we started to notice some trends in the data. And I am so proud to see how the community rallied around this. It took several years to really get behind this and the incredible work of the advocacy group. And I say this as the president of a union. Thank you for doing this, really. So uh, when we're looking, and, um, because, uh, and I'm also a second gen generation Athabasca University employee. I grew up in this town. The university has been a huge part of my life. I'm so happy to see the university will stay here. Um, I, two questions uh, from Minister Nicolaides. Uh, the first question is, um, can we assume that it is status quo for the Athabasca University staff who reside outside of Athabasca? As I'll need to know when I'm telling my members who are not in the town, I have an idea of what to tell those who are in the town. The second question I have is that in the uh, context of a huge job growth strategy in the region and incentives and all that, which is a wonderful thing to hear, um, as you very well know, we are in negotiations right now for a new collective agreement and uh, we applied for our first strike vote in association history. We don't want to go on strike and right now we're facing the loss of some significant and important benefits in exchange for very, very little. And these benefits exist here in the first place to attract people to Athabasca. These benefits are why Athabasca University has grown to four times its size since the 90s and why it is an exceptional, unique university. We would love to see a fair deal, understanding there are economic mandates from the province, and we believe we can really work with you to find a deal everybody likes, but we need to find that deal because uh, the clock is currently ticking and this may be the first online only strike in world history. And although that sounds pretty exciting, I prefer someone else have to do that. <laughs> Thank you. Well, well, thank you so much, and it's great to see you, and, and, and indeed, thank you. I think it was indeed the, the faculty association from the very beginning who started to notice, you know, a lot of those trends, and I think was starting to raise a little bit of the alarm several years ago, so so thank you for that work. I think uh, on your, your second question, uh, absolutely, you know, we, we, we want to work with you, and uh, of course, 
the, the negotiation between the faculty association happens primarily through the board of governors and, and the deal, the, the, any collective agreement that is signed is fundamentally uh, between the board of directors, the board of governors and the faculty association. Uh, but of course the government um, uh, provides some, some, some mandate direction. Uh, you know, happy, happy to work with, uh, with you and the board as best we can to make sure that we, we reach a deal that's, uh, that's suitable for everyone. Um, uh, absolutely. And, and, and to, your, to your first uh, question, you know, I think there's, um, there's still some unanswered questions to your point about, you know, uh, uh, individuals, faculty who maybe work outside the province or outside the area or other individuals that work outside the area. So I think, uh, and, and that's been, I don't want to get into micromanaging the affairs of the institution. So I think it's important for me to set the direction and, and let the institution know this is what we intend to see. And that's why I've impressed upon them to deliver to us a strategy to see uh, primarily starting you know with with executive and senior administrative functions and offices uh, and positions to be based here and and then we can see see from there what that looks like you know again I think it's probably the worst thing for a minister of the government to start getting involved in micromanaging the affairs of a post-secondary institution so I'm gonna give them broad direction and and work with them and, and you know let them do their thing and give me the best the best possible solution so I hope I answered your question but happy to chat further at any other time give me a ring Good afternoon, Camille Wallach, um, Athabasca County Councilor. Um, we know rural returns to rural, and we always have trouble finding physicians, um, veterinarians, professionals. Um, is there a plan, I know you guys put in a plan with U of C to put in for veterinarians, is there any other plans for post-secondary for rural students and increasing funding? Uh, short answer is yes. Um, <laughs> if I can be, if I can be that, uh, that, that precise. Um, yes, the short answer is yes. One of the we are looking extensively at expanding post-secondary programming across all of our post-secondary institutions, but not just in Calgary and Edmonton, but in many of our uh, rural communities and rural colleges as well. In fact, in Budget 2022, which that's uh, I know Mayor Belay is a little hesitant because I have to rush back to Edmonton to vote on that budget uh, to make sure that that we get that moving through. But one of the things in that budget is a $171 million investment over three years specifically to create additional spaces and seats in our post-secondary institutions. We anticipate that that'll create approximately 7,000 new seats. And just to put that into perspective, that is uh, by far the largest uh, seat expansion in at least 10 years, if not more. It is incredibly substantial. Uh, many some of the programs that we're looking at expanding uh, uh, touch on I think you touched on uh, veterinary programs that's one of the target areas that we're looking at to expand 60 million. Uh, correct yes yeah, so, well the, that's right Premier thanks for the correction yeah there's actually it is 60 million going directly to 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 veterinary uh, programs including an expansion of facilities at the University of Calgary uh, veterinary medical school uh, but as well, the, the seat expansion will look at expanding seats in other areas where I know in many of our rural communities uh, we need additional capacity, including healthcare aid and, and LPNs as well. So we'll have more details on that in the coming weeks about which co how many seats uh, in individual colleges are getting and in what program. So, so stay tuned for more details on that. Sure, yeah. Yeah, if I could just add, thank you. I'm having bad luck here. Sorry. Uh, if I could just add the. We have the reside program because we know, look, we got a real problem with um, retention of rural physicians. And, and Albert, it's, it's, an, it's always been a challenge. And it's a challenge in every part of rural Canada. A, a lot of the new medical graduates um, are not, they want to live in the big cities with all the amenities. And even if that means giving up income, extra income that we offer, like we put $90 million out in incentives for rural physician recruitment and retention for 800 physicians, that's over 100,000 per physician, and we have the most generous incentives in the country, and yet we still have challenges with retention. So on your point, we have uh, added the reside program that will be setting aside a certain number of seats in our medical uh, faculties for Albertans coming from rural areas precisely because we know they're more likely to return to and serve in their home communities. 
And uh, we've also built uh, several million dollars in our recent collective bargaining agreement with the Union of Nurses uh, for uh, rural nurse recruitment and, and retention programs as well. So the answer is, uh, is absolutely yes. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to go to uh, the board member Annie Kuzmarczyk next, and then I'll, I'll, I'll get I'll get to you after that. But I, I would like someone to think about. We have Minister Nate Horner here for uh, agriculture, and 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 he's kind of like blended in the back there. So I, I would like someone to to ask a question for him. So or else we'll make him get up and speak. Um, but anyways, uh, so if someone could think of a question. You might want to ask them. Um, Minister Horner. Not in French. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you once again, uh, Premier Kenny, Minister Nicolaitis, uh, Minister Horner, and, and Glenn Van Dyken for joining us at our town hall today. Your uh, presence here is so much appreciated, so welcome to our community. Um, as you notice, we are in a, in a vital, uh, excellent location here in Athabasca, and it's perfectly situated to become the economic, educational, and social hub for the middle of northern Alberta. Do you have any other ideas for this vision and how we can work with your government to advance it? I'll try this, Mike, and appreciate it in English. Thank you. Um, yeah, so... Uh, this role, Rural Economic Development, um, in with the Ag and Forestry Ministry, I'm very grateful uh, for the opportunity. Uh, I would say this community, like many others, has unique challenges, unique strengths. Uh, the first thing we did was some broad engagement with rural Alberta this fall. Uh, 17 sessions, 1,200 people and entity and community groups uh, to, to try to get a good handle on, on what was working and what wasn't. Uh, so we're going to come out with a rural action plan uh, probably early this summer and I'm hoping it, it will really speak to what we heard um, and it's it speaks to kind of what we've heard already that rural life is not just it, it's about everything it's about health care it's about education it's about amenities it's about practical needs in different regions whether it's water natural gas broadband so excited about the good work that's been done on broadband so far because it work, works for every every area but it's also about um, intergovernmental communication and collaboration making sure that our municipalities and our provincial government are pulling in the same direction so i hope uh, not for this community specifically but for all rural communities we're going to have some good news and direction that all of our municipal councils and uh, buildings full of, of rural people that are concerned with their communities like this can, can see and feel uh, in the early summer. So, thank you. Hello? Oh, that's loud. Hey, everybody. How are we doing? This is for Kenny, Premier Kenny. Um, when you say about giving infrastructure and staff and resources into the community, Athabasca University has done anything but that. The president doesn't live at the house. The CIO spends all their money on Amazon Web Services instead of in-house over here. And we have a data facility here that's been totally gutted. Um, the migration of the new staff, the uh, approval rating is what? Let people disapproved about 87%. 87, disapprove of the migration of the leadership of the CIO at AU. Everybody's mad, everybody's frustrated. They're wasting tons of money, province money, your taxpayer duty, to an American corporation so a guy can launch his little space toys into space. And the question is, what are you doing in specifics to make sure that these, the people that are running AU are actually caring about that building across the street that's sitting empty? Well, thanks, sir. That's why we're here, and I would just say this. Please take yes for an answer. Uh, that's exactly what we're here. That's exactly the direction we've given the, the, the board. Now, how they exactly they apply that in terms of what detail, exactly what positions and budget decisions uh, is, is to them, because we the job of the Minister of Education is not to micromanage how many PSIs? 26. 26 post-secondary institutions. We have boards with governance authority under the law but he has given clear direction on the issues that you've just raised. That's why we're here. We've heard you loud and clear. Dimitri, do you want to add to this, please? 
Sure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think you know th those are real important issues and real concerns, and th that's precisely why we're here today, because we've heed. Yeah. Well, and th and that's precisely why we're here, because we've we've seen some of those concerns, we've seen some of those challenging and troubling things happening. So it's it's important for us to make it very clear, and and this is a process. It's going to take some time. We can't flip a switch and things change overnight. So it's important for me as minister to make sure that the institution has the right direction. And that's where we're starting here today, to make sure that they have the right direction and they can then begin to develop a plan that will, uh, will help to address some of those. And there'll be some bumps in, uh, along the way, absolutely. And uh, that's where, uh, that's where the, the government can, can uh, step in and say, hold on a second, you're, you're veering a little bit off course. We need you to go here. We need you to look at some of these dynamics. We give them the parameters, we give them funding, we attach uh, performance measures uh, and outcomes to, the, to that funding. In fact, that's a, a new model that we're implementing now. And, and uh, previously, our institutions were receiving uh, over $2 billion in government funding, and that wasn't attached to any kind of outcomes and measures. We've since changed that, and we sign agreements with each individual post-secondary institution and assign outcomes and objectives as, a, as what we'd like to see in return for the government, for the taxpayer investment that's provided to the post-secondary institution. So we'll be able to use those tools to make sure that we, uh, that we help the institution move in the right direction. And it's gonna take some time and there's, there's gonna be some bumps along the way, but you know, I'm, I'm confident we'll get there. Thank you. So uh, we have a couple of uh, students that are gonna to wanna to ask a question, so here you go. Uh, this one, this one's to Mr. Kenny. Um, as a political figure, you have plenty of competition, and as of lately, you've had extra competition within your party. Uh, how do you plan to stay on top of your position? <laughs> well, you sound like the media. What's going on here? <laughs> Thank you uh, for the question. Well, look, uh, the last two years have been tough on, on everybody, including on our government. And, you know, COVID has, as I said, it's caused a lot of division and a lot of anger. Uh, I think everybody here knows somebody in their families or their business or faith community, whatever, who that there have been all these arguments about COVID policy and vaccines and all the rest of it. Um, and that's been reflected in our party. And partly because I, we had to bring in some public health measures to pre prevent a collapse in our hospitals and to avoid large-scale loss of life, you know? Um, and, and that's ticked off some conservative Albertans who are freedom-loving, as I am. I never came into office to use government powers to restrict people's social or economic activity, and the whole process of the past two years has been incredibly painful and difficult. But, and that's being reflected now in an in a internal debate in the party that I lead. Uh, ultimately, we have this accountability process and the members of my party will vote on whether they want to stay united and move forward or whether they want uh, to take a different direction. Uh, I, uh, and I'm, I'll be happy with what, whatever they decide. I'm, I'm respectful of that. You know, I, I, this is not a partisan event, so I'm trying to avoid getting too political, unlike your question. Um, <laughs> but uh, we do have a, another UCP Premier here, after all, so maybe I, I'll just say that, that um, Look, I stepped up a few years back with the, uh, to, to help propose a way to unite what I would call free enterprise or conservative-minded Albertans into one big party, and, and we won a big election, and we made a lot of progress. So COVID was really tough, not just the disease, but also the global economic collapse, the collapse of energy prices, and all of that. But I've learned this. It's a lot harder uh, to unite than it is to divide. It's a lot harder uh, to lead through multiple historic crises than to criticize from the sidelines. And it's, it's a lot harder uh, to build up than to tear down. And I believe most Albertans want to unite, uh, to build and to lead our way into renewed prosperity. We have another question from students. This one's also for Mr. Kenny. Uh, so my family is from Ukraine, we have really deep ties there, and my great-grandparents came to Alberta to start a new life when Russia was still taking advantage of Ukraine back then. I wanted to ask you uh, what you think about giving more support to Ukraine and how you're going to do that humanitarily, weaponry, stuff like that. Thank you.
Great question. What's your name, young man? Liam Anderson. Anderson doesn't sound very Ukrainian. <laughs> <laughs> it's your mom's side, right? Uh, my grandfather was Polish. Okay, God bless. Well, thank you for the great question. Um, so first of all, this really means a lot to me personally. As a Minister of National Defense, I actually deployed the Canadian Army for the first time ever uh, to Ukraine in 2015 in Operation Unifier to help train their military. And I visited Ukrainian military bases on two or three occasions and saw the brilliant work that our Canadian Armed Forces have been doing to significantly improve Ukraine's military effectiveness. When we started that operation, they still had a lot of Soviet era tactics. They still had pro-Moscow senior officers who were almost working for the other side. And uh, there had to be a process of a deep reform of the Ukrainian military. And, uh, and I was proud to play a small role in, in helping them with that through the Canadian military operation. Uh, over the past seven years and I am so incredibly inspired when I see these brave young Ukrainian soldiers and the people of that country standing up to this uh, violent tyranny of Vladimir Putin. It is an amazing example of human dignity and resilience to see the pride of, of those people standing up for their country and refusing. You know, Putin thought he was going to roll Ukraine in three days. He was going to, uh, that the, he thought the Russian speakers in Eastern Ukraine would cheer Russian troops as liberators and the government would collapse and, and that he would take control of the country in three days. But we're now four weeks into this and Vladimir Putin is getting a very bloody nose. Uh, he is on the losing side of this conflict and the losing side of history. Now you ask, what, what can we do? Um, Alberta as a sub-national government, we don't have a foreign policy or defense policy, so we're limited, obviously, and we support whatever the government of Canada does. Uh, we have done more than any province, having said that. We put uh, uh, $11 million of financial support forward for humanitarian support and, the, uh, and also uh, defensive military equipment, like we're helping them buy for the Territorial Defense Force, which is basically their civilian militia. We're buying uh, flak jackets and helmets, night vision goggles, um, and other uh, non-lethal equipment. Uh, we're delivering that through the World Ukrainian Congress, and um, uh, also I encourage you to make donations to the U oh, U oh, Canadian Ukrainian Congress's Stand with Ukraine campaign. We're also contributing to that. Secondly, we pulled U Russian products off the shelves of AGLC. Thirdly, we divested of the $165 million that the Alberta Investment Management Corporation had in Russian assets. Um, and uh, I've directed that we cut off any Russian suppliers or anything in the government of Alberta. Now, those are all largely symbolic steps. But the single biggest thing that the, the world can do um, to fight Putin is two things. First of all, a total hard embargo on his energy exports. That is what fuels his war machine. And Russia, Russia produces 10 million barrels a day of oil. They export half of that. They're the largest exporter of oil uh, in the world. We're not far behind. Um, but Europe has become overwhelmingly dependent on Russian oil and gas. And this is, a, this is what's filling up his treasury. In fact, and by the way, he did not invade Ukraine a month ago. He invaded Ukraine eight years ago when he invaded Crimea, at Luhansk and Donetsk in the Donbass in Eastern Ukraine. And, and the world should have seen this coming. This guy's been preparing for this for a decade. He, trialed, he tried new weapon systems on civilians in Syria. He's been building up his oil and gas wealth to fund this expansion of his military. And, and people, I, I'll just say this, Prime Minister Harper saw this coming. Prime Minister Harper led the, the, the effort successfully to kick Putin out of the G7 uh, and to impose sanctions on him then. I remember traveling around the world with Prime Minister Harper, sitting down with the Prime Minister of Italy, where we're pleading with him to put sanctions on Putin seven years ago, and they refused to because they were selling luxury products to the Russian, the, the, the nouveau riche people in, in, in Russia. So it is a shame that Europe and, and, and other democracies have turned a blind eye to Putin's decade of aggression. Um, but here's the bottom line. What, what can Alberta do in a big, meaningful way? Well, we have, we have the third largest oil reserves on Earth, the fifth largest natural gas reserves. Um, this is not just about Putin. 
Uh, uh, President Biden has brought in an embargo on Russian oil imports to the U.S. Okay, good. That, that was 900,000 barrels a day. Keystone XL would have displaced that with 900,000 barrels a, a day of Alberta energy. We need, as a matter of national and international urgency, to get energy infrastructure built out of Canada so we can compete with and displace not just oil and gas from Putin's Russia, but Biden's now going to Venezuela, Iran, and Saudi Arabia, asking them, not Canada, but to those OPEC dictatorships, asking them to, to replace the Russian oil uh, supply. This makes no sense. Iran uses their oil money to finance dropping bombs on civilians in Syria. Saudi uses oil money to finance dropping bombs on civilians in Yemen. Venezuela uses oil money to oppress their political opponents in a dictatorship. So I, I'll close with this. The big long-term strategic thing that Alberta could do would be getting pipelines built to our east and west coast and southbound to displace conflict blood oil for good from the global markets. Okay, I've been informed that we have time for one more question and, and I'm sorry someone down here has been waiting a long time, so we'll, we'll go here and then I'm going to turn the uh, microphone over to Reeve Brian Hall, who will um, do some thank yous and some closing remarks. Thank you. Uh, Edie Ewell, Town of Athabasca Council. Hi. Just wanted to ask you, I know that... Uh, <laughs> not used to this, sorry. I know that the bill to um, automatically charge people with speeding tickets and not go to court has been perhaps pulled back. I'm wondering, and I thank you for that. I'm not a speeder, but thank you for that. <laughs> um, I just wanted to know if you're going to hire more prosecutors so yeah. that you can get rid of this, yeah. this in and out. Yeah. Great question, because we brought that in precisely to get cut the backlog of cases in the provincial court that was allowing the property criminals to get to go through the revolving door. We had so many thousands of cases backed up that the prosecutors just weren't, and police were getting frustrated, they would charge these repeat offenders and they would never get a day in court because it was taking years and so we, we wanted to simplify the, uh, the process for just regular traffic violations and we've heard Albertans on that so we've taken the step back but yes we are hiring more prosecutors um, and They've been under a pay freeze for like a decade, and so a lot of them, have, the more senior ones, have been leaving to go into private practice. So we've been losing a lot of our, uh, our um, more experienced uh, provincial crown prosecutors. And so yes, we have now lifted that freeze on them, and we have we put forward, um, I think it's forty million dollars to hire additional prosecutors to get on top of that backlog, so that the real criminals. I'm not talking about people who maybe go a buck 30 well, between here and Edmonton. I'm sure no one does that. Um, but the serious criminals, we, we want to make sure that they face serious consequences and we need to deal with the backlog. And thank you for the question. Thank you. We, we, we are uh, oh, we're out of time on that. Premier Kenny, Ministers Horner, Minister Nicolades, Emily Van Dyken, thank you for coming to our community to share this news. I especially want to acknowledge the Premier and Minister Nicolaitis for their personal engagement on this issue that has such a deep impact on our community and our region. Friends and neighbours, I appreciate that you've spent part of your day with us here. The sheer volume of people in this room speaks to the passion and commitment we have for our community and for Athabasca University. All of Alberta is made stronger when rural Alberta succeeds. Today we see that the Government of Alberta has taken seriously your concerns, the concerns for the future of our community, region, and that of rural Alberta. We see what happens and what can be accomplished when we stand united as a community. To our friends from Athabasca University, President Scott, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Premier and Ministers, uh, thank you again for sharing the encouraging news. Neighbours, thank you for speaking up. Our job is not done today. We must continue to work to make Athabasca and our region a great place to live and work. I wish you safe travels home. Thank you and have a good day.